Me. Me. So he was kind enough not to do that. But you guys were amazing. You were really beautiful. So thank you. Really, really. You broke my heart. Thank you. Um, I think the way we said we were going to do this is we're just going to open it up to questions. And uh, we'll, we'll all try and answer. Uh, can you hear me? This is like the Emmys, they cut your mic off. <laughs> so, first question. <laughs> what? <I don't> <laughs> um, it was great. It was it was completely unexpected that a movie like like the Laramie Project would get an Emmy nomination was so out of left field and so unexpected and nobody ever believed anything like that would happen of the subject matter the form it's radical it's not your typical movie it's it's so it, there were so many levels on which it was completely unexpected and uh, so when it happened it was kind of a surprise and it was not only was nominated it was nominated four times and it was it, you know it was great it was really really great. How, how did it feel to lose? That's a diff did, did you all hear the question? The question is the character, the Latino character who's in jail. How did he end up in the cutting room floor? Because it, he was in the play and he wasn't in the movie. We lost an hour from the play to make the movie. So there was a slew of material that we lost in, uh, on the way to the movie. And the truth is that Laramie is a very, very white place. And it was really difficult to think that the only Latino representation we had in the film was somebody who was in jail and was that character. So it was both partially that we just got rid of several characters and several through lines. And also that we didn't, I didn't, as a Latino man, I didn't feel comfortable. It's very difficult, but, but film is a much more um, economic medium. So you can tell larger stories in, le in less time. Uh, you know, a, a, an image tells a, a thousand words, and it's true. And so th there were things that were lost, but things that were gained. I mean, one of the big questions we pose in the work, in Tectonic Theater Project, is what is the thing that theater can do that only theater can do? What lives in the theater? And that question became really helpful when we made the film, because then the question became is what lives in images, and how do you communicate from the film, from on film? So it was, it was difficult, but not terrible. Yes. How many of you were here this afternoon? Raise your hands. Do you mind if I repeat the story? Okay. I'm sorry. This is a very strange audience because did somebody say yes? This is a strange audience because I talked to half of the people in this room already once today, so they're going to uh, hear the same stories twice. Um, it was amazing. It was really wonderful. What happened was that um, we, were, we were terribly nervous. That the, the company was very nervous because it was, we had already spent by that point almost close to two years making the play, and this was trial by fire. Here we were coming back to Laramie to show it to the people of the town. So we were terrified, but what, what we didn't realize was that the people of the town were even more terrified than we were. Uh, because they were going to get to see what we had gathered. Uh, it's one thing when you live inside a town and you have a group of people you know. It's another when a group from outside comes in, takes a, a larger sample of the population and then puts it together. Because invariably, you will see people on stage that you don't know. You will get to know more about your community from seeing this than from, in a way, your own experience, or at least a different kind of experience. So that was very threatening to that community. Um, so when the play began, as soon as the lights went out, they, they stopped breathing. It was, it was this thing that happened. And then the, um, 
the lights came up on the stage and the actors came in and they weren't breathing either. So nobody was breathing in that room. And then what happened was that, that something happened on stage and there was laughter. And the laughter broke the room open. And then the communication started. And it was really beautiful because as soon as a character would appear, there would be pockets in the audience that would laugh, like because that person was there <laughs> watching himself or herself on stage, surrounded by his or her peers. So that was really interesting. But, but what was really exciting, for example, when Jonas Sloniker says, you know, as a gay man, I can't live in this town. That was confrontational and shocking and revelatory because he said it to us in the privacy of the interview. And all of a sudden, he was saying it to the community in which he lived. He was saying, I cannot live here. And that was really moving. And the other thing that it did, because as you see, it tells the story of the town and the turmoil and the, and the heartbreak and all of the things that the town went through. It was very uh, healing, I think, for the town to relive one of the most horrific years of their lives within the security of the theater. So it was very moving. At the end, there was a great standing ovation, and people really, uh, the, the, the actors lost it and started sobbing and applauded the audience. It was this incredible moment of revelation. that I didn't know, I didn't know theater could do that. Even as I was writing it and I was directing it, I didn't know that theater could do that. It was when I got to Laramie, when I got into that theater, that I realized the power of, of this form. The play we did before uh, the Laramie Project was Gross Indecency, The Three Trials of Oscar Wilde. And uh, Laramie Project right now is the second most performed play in the country. And in its time, Gross Indecency was, I think, the third most performed play in the country. It became very successful. So for the first time, Tectonic Theater Project is now 10 years old. And it was the first time in the company's history that we had money in the bank. <laughs> before or since. <laughs> And so it was the f so when Matthew was murdered, we could we had money in the bag, so we could take ten of us and go, uh, even if we didn't know that a play would happen. As a, as a way of making the making theater, it seemed right. It was like a good experiment. To, it was can we make a play out of this? Does theater have a role to play in the current dialogue of of events? Um, so I always find that there's something rather poetic about. Oscar Wilde financing our trip to make a play about Matthew Shepard. Um, I got handed the mic here. So, uh, well, I would say, uh, obviously, from an outsider's perspective, well, I'm not an outsider anymore, I guess, but from uh, from the perspective of going into a play where you know you're going to be uh, performing roles of people that actually e exist. It's not the playwright's imagination. It, it really happened, and these are their real words. The only thing that we could really do was just dig in and find all the information we could about every person that we were playing. Uh, and I think... Second to those people themselves, we knew them just about as well. Uh, we, I mean, books and huge folders full of information that we've compiled. We went through a question process where we questioned each other on, on uh, just lots of questions about what the, you know answers to their characters, and we went through that with all the characters. And uh, it was just, uh, it was, and it was amazing what we didn't get from the information we found or from the play we found and we helped each other find it, and it was really, through the process, it was very, very cool. I think, <laughs> and that's all. <laughs> one, one of the things that was really shocking, eerie, was uh, in, in many occasions how close you guys got to the way they sounded and spoke, and uh, it, it was really, like I, I, I was sitting there, and I was, all of a sudden it was before my chair broke. I was very moved until my chair broke. 
And then, and then of course, I started thinking, oh, they're going to think I hate it. I broke my chair. I will not sit here. But every so often, I would hear a line, and it would, and it would really freak me out because it was exactly how the person meant it. And w when we were writing it, we took a great deal of care to every hum or things. But you guys really nailed it. It was great. And the chair wasn't about you. I don't think we'll do something like this again. Uh, I think our last play, uh, a lot of what tectonic theater does is pose questions about what is theater and how does theater behave and what constitutes a play and what is a theatrical language. Uh, so that each, each play that we do, we try to pose questions about form, about what is new theater, how does it operate, how many more realistic and naturalistic plays do we need to see before we start saying, okay, these forms are obsolete, what are the new forms, how do we speak to an audience today, we have become so much savvier, we know so much more, what are the new forms in the theater, and that's a lot of the questions that we pose in Tectonic Theater Project. So the last play was based on historical material, which was gross indecency, this place was based about on a current event. We don't know what the next one is going to be. It may be an adaptation of a novel. It may be, um, it may be a comedy that one of our writers writes. I, we don't know yet. I mean, the, 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 the guiding uh, idea is that it will always question what is the theater. So we're not only interested in making the new play happen. We're interested in posing questions about the form, about the art form. Um, and the, the other thing on a very personal note, um, I can't do another of these. It's just too costly. You, you know, I've spent the last seven years of my life dealing with the destruction of two men, and I just don't have it in me anymore. I need, I need to do something. I need to, I need to do a play about somebody who doesn't die in the end. I mean that. I, it, you know, we're, we're, there is a way in which you're a carpenter, you know, and you're making the work and you're doing the things, but there's another way in which, unless you put yourself in there, the work doesn't work. Uh, and, and uh, you know, after doing, I, I had to direct Gross Indecency like four times because we, we, we did it in Los Angeles and San Francisco and then I did it in London. And then with the Laramie Project, the same, and then doing the movie. I was, I, was, I was really scared in the editing room when I was cutting Dennis Shepard's speech because at a certain point, I mean, you cannot cut that text, you cannot cut that scene without listening. And at a certain point, you just can't listen to it anymore. It's heartbreaking. Uh, and you did such a gorgeous, magnificent job with it. But, yeah. Yeah. Who has a question? Catherine. Um, how do you become a member of the Tectonic Theater? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know how do you get to Carnegie Hall? <laughs> Practice. <laughs> no, no, no. There, there is, there, it's not... We're a little hermetic, but not terribly hermetic. W what happens is we're always doing readings, we're always looking at new things, we're always w workshopping things. So what happens is people send us resumes and meet with us, and whenever there's a chance we bring people. But we never, well, that's not true, but we hardly ever audition people for a show. Uh, we audition people for a workshop or things like that, and then, so, so there are levels. Uh, but the thing is, it's very interesting company because you know people who worked on the Laramie Project were working on one piece for two years. Not every actor is willing to do that. There are actors who really want to be given a script and do the play, and you know, so I, so it, it, it but that's how. No, the only thing we knew when we went to, I, again, this issue that you're calling format, that's what's at the root of the Tectonic Theater Project. That's what interests us the most. H what are those forms? So we didn't know. That's one of the questions we went to Laramie with. What we did know about Laramie, the, 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 the thing that led us there, was that I wanted to tell the story of the town. I knew when I got there that I didn't want to tell Matthew's story, 
And I didn't want to tell the perpetrator story. I wanted to tell the story of the town of Laramie. It was based on the belief that if we listened to their words, to what they were saying, we would gather a document about not only where Laramie was at, but where the nation was at. And that was the hypothesis that led us there. Did you all hear the question? When did we get to Laramie and why did we this, what was it about the media coverage that made us want to go to Laramie? Um, we, went, we got there four, four and a half weeks after Matthew was dead, uh, after Matthew died. Not after the murder, but after Matthew died. Um, and the reason why I wanted to go there was because I'm very interested in, in historical events that operate as markers. So, you know, M Matthew Shepard, we, we can all in America now say Matthew Shepard and we know what we're talking about. It was one of those m historical markers. From now on, we will know that this happened. And uh, those moments usually make people speak, are moments of such great size and magnitude and nature that they force people to speak. And that's, I thought, if we go there at this moment and gather those words, we will have this document about how we're living together. And not only about homosexuality, but about, you know, as you see in the play, Matthew was murdered because he was gay, period. He was also murdered because there are all these other barriers and fault lines that are dividing us as a culture. And, you know, fault lines and barriers that have to do with class, with violence, with education, with, with uh, the definition of masculinity. You know, there were, Matthew was also murdered because there was a great class distinction between them, between him and, and the boys who killed him. Matthew was also murdered because he was going to university and these boys were high school dropouts. There were all these divisions, these breaking points uh, that played a part in the murder. And one of the reasons for going there was because I, I Im very immediately sensed that whatever it was, it was going to tell me something about where we were at as Americans. Uh, <laughs> one of the things uh, for me, I, I share this with the cast, but the most rewarding thing for me is I had a friend of the family who is a Lutheran minister who came to see our show, and um, afterwards he was down in the green room, and you know my sister and I went to hug him, and he had tears in his eyes, and he was just like, thank you for telling this story. Thank you. And for me, that is the most rewarding thing that I could ever receive along ACTF, I remind anything. Just the fact that that one person said thank you for telling this story and took all that in was just awesome for me. Um, I know that for me a big thing was I felt for the first time um, as an actor doing what I love to do more than anything, I got to affect people really, <laughs> truly for the betterment of themselves, I think. To make someone sit there, at least one person sit there and maybe reevaluate who they were and what their beliefs were. And maybe possibly prevent someone from becoming the next Aaron McKinney or Russell Henderson through telling this story. And I just think that that is amazing. And that's what's been the most rewarding for me. And yeah. Same thing I was gonna say. Um, definitely is just after the show's over, without you know, without fail, every performance, going down in the green room and seeing people I see every day, you know, and and just looking at looking at someone who ha you know has been crying because this story touched them and moved them, and making you know making people reevaluate just things they say in their everyday life, which you wouldn't think normally might you know affect someone, but people walked away from this. You know, people said to me, you know, wow, you know, there are things that I say that I don't mean and I need to reevaluate myself. And just having that power to like touch people and make them 
you know, think about things they do, think about things they say is definitely the most rewarding. Um, the thing for me uh, that, st that struck me the most was, was when I went down into the green room after the show and my aunt had come to see the show and my aunt is not a theater goer. She enjoys football and another one with sports or anything like that. But the fact that she, she had come to see the show and um, this is probably like maybe the second show she had seen, seen in her life besides like the Nutcracker or something like that. And um, after the show, she's down in the green room and she's not saying anything. And I'm like, why are you so quiet? What's, what's wrong? And um, we go to get something to eat and she pulls me aside and um, she's like, nothing has ever touched me as much as the performance of, of, your, of you and your peers in tonight's production. And you know, and that was the thing for me, because my aunt doesn't, she doesn't do theater. She's not, all you people here for the most part are theater goers and you understand it and you get it. But the fact that she got it was probably, it was, it was the thing for me that did it for me. It was deep, it was cool. Um, I think from more on an acting um, standpoint, from the very beginning, Bill was like, you need to trust every single person that you're on stage with. And like, it's easy to like depend on yourself as an actor or be like, I, I know I'm gonna do this. And in this show, you had to trust everybody. And like, I trusted every single person on the stage 110%. And I knew that they were all gonna like knock every single person's socks off. And it's the first time I've ever felt like that. And like, it's just gonna be hard to say goodbye to that. But it was fabulous. Um. Uh, uh, my 14-year-old brother and my Catholic high school principal mom and my 76-year-old Polish Chicago grandma all came to see the show <laughs> on, on the same night. And uh, I think that and all you guys here, I mean, the show is over, but you guys are staying for something. Um, I don't know if, it, I don't know if I, the word I want to use is awareness or, or just humanity, sort of this thing that we all are kind of this yeah I'm deep and cheesy whatever but <laughs> it's it's we're all part of something and I think that this show in particular has helped me to not only realize that but help me show that to other people and you know what I mean my 76 Polish grandma and 14 year old brother both saw the show and they both came up to me afterwards and they you know it's they've got a little bit of something now that I could share with them part of me and I think that's great, and I think it's helping people to keep dialogue going about issues that are going on and about the theater. And I think those are really, really important uh, things that we need to talk about in society. And so I'm really glad that we get to be part of this exposure and get people involved. Um, I will say, uh, obviously, besides the same thing that we've all been saying, is just that uh, the people that we're touching and the stories that we have of our family and our friends that have come and have been reached, and people that you didn't think could be reached have been reached uh, as well uh, as that I would say one of the things that I will take with me is how it's affected me uh, you know I, I always think about this every night when I hear Rulon Stacy say I never realized the magnitude of which people can hate and until I was really put into this play and, and experienced all these things that we've experienced, I've always said, oh yeah, I know these things happen. I see these things happen. Yeah, okay. And I, I will never, ever forget that feeling when you're standing on stage. And I know it's nothing compared to what they actually went through, but it's, it's done enough for me to always remember that people can hate. And there's always going to be horrific and horrible things out there in the world. And there's always going to be these wonderful, amazing people that step up and do something about it and, and survive and push past it. And that's something that I will always take with me. Uh, this has really empowered me to uh, take control of my own future, I think, um, and just to show myself how lucky I really am. It's also shown me that... Uh, it's really affected things that have happened in my past and showed me how lucky I really am and showed me how gracious I should be to live here and to have such an accepting family and just be able to touch people by using this medium and to say, hey, it's not okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
I have a couple things. Uh, one of mine, for, uh, just the, the very dynamic of the show, um, which is to uh, uh, affect a group of people and to start dialogue and to maybe provoke some kind of change uh, was really, uh, the very nature of the play itself allowed all of us to experience it at the same time that you guys were, which is, uh, as, an, as an actor, I, don't, I haven't given myself or I haven't been given the opportunity to be able to, to really feel on stage, because uh, after a period of time with rehearsals, you, you start you stop looking at it from an audience perspective and you, and you become selfish with it and it becomes your play and you present it to people and then you go away. But this was something that I got to come out on stage on and uh, watch it every night with you guys and get to perform at the same time, um, which I like doing both so much that um, it, was, it was nice to be able to combine the two. Another thing which um, is not really connected but it, it's, it's something that meant a lot to me was something very simple. Uh, the past two years, uh, these doors didn't have locks on them. And really late after parties, like at 3 a.m., um, I, I, would, I would come in here and I would, and there would be a work, there would be a ghost light on, and there would be the only, there would be a singular, like 45 watt bulb in the middle of the stage. And that would be the, the only light that this whole place had. And I would just walk around and I would look out and I, you know, I'd, I'd talk to myself or whatever, but. <laughs> But, but the thing that, that I really wished when I was up here and I was, you know, I was just like looking out was that I, I wish I could feel this relaxed and comfortable on stage. And I wish that I could, I, I wish I could walk out, and I literally thought this, this isn't, I'm not making this up because of this, but I really thought that I, I would love to be able to be in a show where I can just walk out and look at the audience and enjoy the fact that I'm there with them. And that's exactly what I get to do at the beginning and the end of the show. And it's, uh, it was great, so. <laughs> you, I just wanted to briefly respond with, uh, as a teacher, um, the thing that's been the most uh, profoundly uh, exciting for me and that's had the most impact on me is about a week and a half before the show opened, I looked at a cast and said, it's your show. And I'd never done that up until like, in a show, maybe the last dress rehearsal or something, because they're all so good. And as the, as the show progressed and as the shows, as the rehearsals progressed and as the show has progressed, it's, it's amazing because I, and Michael O'Hare, you mentioned something when you were walking out about an actor tonight, and I thought to myself, uh, in, a, in a period of six weeks, I've never seen people grow up so much. And that's probably what's, what's had the greatest impact on me, was just seeing people um, become adults. And I really love that. We're available after September 28th. <laughs> and for a small fee, we'll go anywhere. <laughs> we need scholarship money. <laughs> I was chatting after the second act with Moises um, outside, I was thinking to myself that I'm so glad, particularly after he told me what he told me last night, that I had never ever experienced a production, uh, that I'd never seen the movie. Uh, I had seen a production a couple of years ago, uh, but I actually was more provoked by what I thought the production did, wasn't able to accomplish than what the production accomplished, if that makes any sense. I was so moved, but I also was thinking as a director. Um, most of what I, 
what I did was, I, I'm a firm believer in collaboration, and through collaboration between these people on stage and the collaboration of many of my colleagues and the collaboration of my designers, I feel as though that what I was able to accomplish was more so based on the people I had around me. Um, and I think that any person who is a really a truly uh, an artist who understands what art is supposed to be about accepts that. And any time it becomes dictatorial, I think it's dangerous. I think there, there always has to be someone who is the person that says, I'm going to make a choice. Um, it's an inside <laughs> cast joke. Uh, but but with, that, with that being said, I think that any time I am so close-minded that I don't allow everyone else to impact what I'm doing, then I think that I'm uh, hindering myself as not only an artist but a human being. And so a lot of what I did was I made a lot of early decisions on my own, and then through the course of the process, just let what the actors were bringing to the table uh, affect how I sort of went about uh, looking and altering and shifting the play and how it was being told. So I just didn't try to worry about anybody else except for the people on stage and the people in the audience. Good night. When the show was originally done with Moises, um, it was a smaller cast. Uh, so I, with the help of Tony Cirk, who assisted, was my assistant director, we went through and looked at all of the, of the lines, as I called them, and tried to figure out how best we would serve the actors and the play by trying to, to divide amongst six females and six males um, without giving a lot of thought to uh, gender or ethnicity or something like that. We were just trying to make the best lines for people, as I called them. And I wanted to make sure that everyone sort of had a meaty line they could associate with sort of some smaller ones. Some of the lines have a couple of meaty. Um, I think of Reggie and Rebecca. That's, that's a pretty, two pretty sizable roles. And Rulon Stacy and uh, um, the other guy, Father Roger. Um, <laughs> But, but in general, I tried to make sure that the actors were, were all of the actors were given incredibly sort of uh, difficult jobs to create uh, all those different characters. But at the same time, there was some sort of sense about why, why I was having certain people play different characters. Sometimes I wanted, you know, certain people to be able to play roles that I thought were in opposition to each other. I, I love the fact that Dennis Shepard is also Matt Galloway. And I love the fact that Jeb plays both... Uh, both of the of the of the boys who did this, I, I think it really forces the actor to really push, and I really love that. Um, <clears throat> I think that several activist groups have used this, the production. Uh, I know that, for example, Judy Shepard, Matthew's mom, um, gets monthly lists of where the production is being done, and she goes and speaks in the colleges and in the uh, theaters where, where it's being done. So in that way, yes. What it has done as well is uh, encourage uh, right-wing groups to protest it. Uh, so, for example, Fred Phelps, who you saw tonight, is now protesting a production of, in a high school in Oakland. Um, the University of Maryland chose the play to be uh, the play to be given to all the incoming students. Uh, so they bought 10,000 copies and gave it to all the incoming students. And now there's a right-wing group that is threatening to sue them for doing that, and so on. So there's, you know, when when, it, when, when a play begins to get to that size where it begins to make a difference, it, it it, yes, it, it inspires people to kind of rise and act, and also it inspires the forces of evil. We have time for about one or two more questions. Right down here, Maggie. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, we couldn't see you. You should be an agent. 
Hollywood awaits. So in terms of the, actually, you know what? There's one thing I need to say because now I'm Moises, not Moises. My one note. <laughs> My name. Uh -huh. You see, he was right. Okay, so in terms of <laughs> Moises. Um, so the, the, the reason why we got such a great cast for the film is because we were fortunate enough when we decided that we we're going to make the movie, the play had been running in New York for a while and a bunch of these people had seen it. So Christina Ricci and Steve Buscemi and Laura Lini and these guys had seen the play in New York and loved it. So when word got out that we were making the movie, they called and they said, we want to be in this movie. And I was fortunate enough to have like great producers. Uh, <laughs> I just sounded like a valley girl. Like great producers, like... <laughs> A Venezuelan Valley girl. <laughs> uh, and that was great. And they, were, and they did the rest of the job of like getting the, 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 the rest of the cast. But yes, I agree with you. We we're really fortunate. Uh, these people were such beautiful performers. Uh, as far as your question about uh, switching characters that fast and things like that, uh, I will say as an actor... Uh, that switch after Dennis Shepard into Matt Galloway is the toughest thing I've ever had to do on stage. And uh, I keep thinking it's going to get easier as the show goes on, and it doesn't. Um, but uh, the only thing I can really say to you is, is just that uh, you just got to shake it off back there. And as soon as that light hits you and you come back out, uh, you know, in that 30 seconds, you got to do what you got to do. You know, I got a stage manager back there handing me Kleenexes and, you know, I got that bar towel. I'm wiping my face off as I come in and, you know, and, and, and you just got to, the words do it for you. I mean, you, you know, Dennis, he, I can't say this enough. You set it up perfect. I mean, Dennis Shepard comes out here and just tears your heart out. And then Matt Galloway comes out here talking about funneling systems, <laughs> you know, and it just, it allows the audience to take a breath of air with you as the actor. And I was taking it with you guys, man, let me tell you. So, it's I think someone maybe should do it, but not me. <laughs> um, I know that we, we've reached the time. I know the cast would like to present something to Mr. Kaufman. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to ask all of you to join us on stage for a reception uh, that's going to follow here on the Laramie Project stage. But once again, thank you to Mr. Kaufman for joining us this evening.